I met some very nice people. I had a great time. Did it really help my business? Time will tell. If you're a business, you need to get out there and meet your customers. If you're someone who refuses to go along to get along, if you question whether the status quo is good enough for you and your family, you want to leave this world better off than you found it, and you consider independence a sacred thing, you may be a prepper, a gardener, a homesteader, a survivalist, a farmer, a rancher, an environmentalist, or a rugged outdoorsman. This show is for those who choose the road less traveled, the road to self-reliance, for those living a daring adventure, life off the grid. Scott Smith has been in the commercial construction industry for over 40 years, building quality projects that have provided his customers years of trouble-free use. That same pride in worksmanship is exactly what's led him to inventing the earth-to-earth compost pail, hoping he can help every homeowner to compost and do their part to help the environment. Scott Smith, welcome to the Off the Grid Biz Podcast. Thank you. Hey, besides what we heard in your bio, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. I'm a construction superintendent by trade. I've been in construction business all my life. I was raised to where you do a job right, try to do the best job you can. You know, you got to get up early, you got to work every day, try to earn your paycheck, and you take pride in what you do. It's kind of how I live my life by, you know what I mean? And um, if something's not done right, you tear it apart, you fix it. You know, you make it right. You know what I mean? Because if it don't work, what good is it? So that's kind of the idea behind Earth Earth Compost Pail. I spent a couple years making them, redesigning them, so they work right, so they're easy to use, so the handles are right, so it does what it's supposed to do. Trying to provide to the average homeowner a product that is easy to use, affordable, and it does exactly what it's designed to do. You know, help you compost all your organic, organic kitchen scrap. Every person can do their part to try to help do a little bit to help the environment. Awesome. So what actually led you to building the compost pail? It started from a phone call. Um, A friend of mine is a truck driver and he drives over the road. He called me one day. He's on top of a mountain up in Montana and he's stuck in a blizzard. He can't get down the mountain. He had to go to the bathroom. So he goes back to the back of his trailer to go to the bathroom and a moose started chasing him. So a moose started chasing him. So he's running down the hill. So he's trying to get away from the moose. Finally gets back to his truck and he calls me up and he says, he says, man, you're not going to believe what happened to me. I'd go to the bathroom and went back to my trailer and a moose started chasing me. I said, you mean to tell me you got a $300,000 tractor trailer and you don't have a bathroom in your tractor trailer? So it started from that conversation to me on working on designing an inexpensive composting toilet because he was looking at some different composting toilets and they're anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000. I started just working on that as like just something to do. It transformed into me going from working on a composting toilet to working on a composter because that's more where my loyalties lie because I like to garden, I like to play in the yard, I like to do certain things. And so I started messing around with that. So that's kind of how it transformed in me working on a compost pit. It was funny how it went from a phone call to me spending two and a half years working on this compost payoff of filing for a patent, getting my patent, having a product that I market, I sell, and it actually works. And out of all the compost pails that I've sold, I've had zero returns. So that tells me one thing is that um, even though my product is affordable, that it's a good product. The customers that are buying the product, using their product, must be having success or I'd be getting some returns. So that makes me feel good. And a few months ago, I attended the Mother Earth News Fair in Frederick, Maryland. So I'm talking to a few of the distant customers coming by and an older lady was there. She says, this is a great idea. She says, if you could sell a million of these and stop millions of tons of organics from going into the landfill, you would have a successful life. And I started thinking about what she said to me. And it made me smile because how true would that be that if my small invention could have a positive input on helping people reduce their carbon footprint to help each person do a little bit to help the environment. And I mean, that really hit a chord with me. Is my product right for everybody? Probably not, but it's right for a majority of the people. Yeah, do I want my business to succeed? Absolutely, I do. I want my business to succeed. When I leave this earth, it would be nice to have a positive impact. Do I have all the answers? I really don't. I know one thing that 
all the years that I spent designing this product and testing it and testing it and have family members test it, that it does exactly what it's designed to at compost faster and more efficiently than any other product out there on the market. And I'm really proud of what I've designed. Composting is not a knowledge that we're born with. Composting is just like recycling. It's something that's learned. You know what I mean? So it's passed down from father to son, mother to daughter. So you get done with your plastic water bottle, you throw it into the plastic recycling bin. So if you get done with your organic kitchen scraps, if you throw them into the composter, instead of throwing them into the trash can, and so the more education we can give everybody to let them understand that we only have one planet, we have one earth, but people polluting all the rivers and throwing all the trash. And it's just like now, today is like a disposable world. People eat something and they throw it in the trash. Trash guy comes, picks it up, takes it away. And they think that's the end of the problem. That's just the beginning of the problem. Because now you're putting more trash bags into the landfill. You're putting all your organics into the landfill. You know, composting on a large scale is a huge job with collecting all the organic materials, the trucks, the labor, the CO2 you're putting in the air, hauling it all to the landfill, and then all the equipment all there. My compost pail can compost over 520 pounds of organics a year. That's over a quarter of a ton. So if four of us do it, that's one ton. If I can get a million people, that's 250,000 tons that we're not putting in the landfill. Before I started working on a compost pail, I didn't have the knowledge and understanding how much waste was actually being taken to the landfill because it wasn't something I was reading about. It wasn't something that I was involved in. The one thing I tried to do when I invented this compost pail, I tried to make it out of the best materials I could find. For being in construction business, I wanted to make something that was made out of the best materials and it was affordable, that it worked. And it worked every time. There was no guesswork. And so somebody from five years old to 80 years old can use it and they'll get years and years of success out of it. So I tried to make the best product I could. And I feel I've come up with a pretty good product. I really have. Awesome. That's really cool. And just to let the audience in on it, the way I met Scott, he was a vendor at the Albany Mother Earth News Fair. Just to give you a little bit of an understanding of this. And if I have pictures, I'll include them on this post over at offthegridbiz.com. He actually had his setup outside. He has a back of a trailer all set up. You get to see these compost pails there. He shows you a live demonstration. It's a very impressive setup. Is this your first business, Scott? Have you ran businesses before? Have you had your own business? Never had my own business before. I did some home improvement stuff, but I've always been in the commercial construction industry. And I did the Mother Earth News Fair in Frederick, and we rented a tent. We had a table and all, but it just was... um, didn't suit my needs. That's why I purchased a trailer. And one thing that people need to understand is that I'm from Maryland. I drove from Maryland to Oregon, which was almost 4,000 miles to attend the Mother Earth News Fair because I was hoping everything that we hear on the East Coast is that the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, they're all in the forefront of the composting world. It's funny. Stopped in California, then we went to Oregon. We stayed in Albany, Oregon, I was talking to a bunch of different people there, and they had just as much knowledge as the people on the East Coast about composting. They asked people to eat compost. What's that? Why would I compost? I'm seeing that the lack of education, the lack of knowledge, is from coast to coast. You know, it's great that San Francisco and Seattle and those couple little cities are doing it, but um, those two cities can't correct the problem. <laughs> you know, it's every city, every little town. It's just... There's so much positive that could come out of it. The more people we could educate and the more people we could get the understanding of. You see, here's the the deal. Your goal is not to get compost. Compost will be your end result. Your goal is to reduce your carbon footprint, trying to compost as much of your organic kitchen scraps as you can so it don't go into the landfill. So whether you have a garden Everyone knows someone that has a garden or they have a community garden or there's a forest or there's some place around that once you compost all your your organics, that's over a quarter of a ton that we're not putting into the landfills. It would be great if we could go from San Francisco and Seattle to San Francisco, Seattle, Denver, Baltimore, Orlando. It's nothing but positive that could come out of it. If I train my daughter and train my son to compost and to recycle and not litter, Then they'll train their kids, and then they'll train their kids. Then next thing you know, once we all understand, hey, 
When you're riding down the road, you don't throw your trash out the window. You wait till you get to a gas station and you put your trash in a trash receptacle. Sometimes it's just a matter of education. My stepfather taught me something a long, long time ago, and it stuck with me my whole life. It takes more energy to be a bad person than it does be a nice guy. It's easier to smile than it is to frown. So when you compost, it makes you feel good not throwing your organics into the trash. It makes me feel good that it makes other people feel good. You know, I mean, because my trash got cut in half. So I'm putting one less trash bag in the landfill a week. So if I put 52 less trash bags in the landfill a week, it might not be a lot, but at least it's something. How did you first become a vendor for the Mother of News Fair? I mean, you said it was in Frederick. Did you reach out to them? Did they reach out to you? I was going to attend the Mother Earth News. I was searching online about different compost things and different things to do with recycling and composting and stuff. And Mother Earth popped up on the internet. So I started reading a little bit more about it and I reached out to them. And the year before, I was going to attend one of the shows they were having in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania, but some personal issues came up and I couldn't attend. I paid for the booth, but I just couldn't attend. I tried to make it a conscious effort this year to do these two shows. I'm just trying to promote composting as many people as I meet because the last three years of my life, I live, breathe, eat, sleep composting. The more people I, I try to educate, maybe I can make a positive effect. The only promise I can make to everyone out there, whoever's listening, is that I stand behind my product. And if there's anything I can do to help people use the product to the best of its ability, I'm here for them. That's a huge business plan into itself. If you can really be able to create great customer service, that's something that people will go miles for. So that's awesome to hear. And we have a lot of other executives, business owners, entrepreneurs that listen. Do you think it'd be worthwhile for them to go to similar events and do vending like you did? Have you seen success from it? Well, it's a little too early to be able to see about how you would um, rate success. I've never driven to California and Oregon before and seen some beautiful country. I drove 6,966 miles from my house all the way through 40, through Arizona, New Mexico, California, and all the way back to Wyoming. And all that. So I've seen a, some beautiful country during the trip. Did I make enough money to pay for my trip to go to Albany? Absolutely not. But I met some very nice people. I had a great time. Did it really help my business? Time will tell. If you're a business, you need to get out there and meet your customer. And you need to meet some other vendors that are kind of in the same business. Even though a lot, most of the, of the vendors that were at that show didn't have my product, they were doing other things, you know, whether it was flowers or plants or straw houses or whatever it was. Most of the people there still had the mindset of, it's our earth, let's try to take care of it the best we can. Did we see eye to eye on everything? Well, no, we didn't, but we all had one going in mind. You know, it was like, we have one planet, man. But if I do a little bit, you do a little bit, hey, man, a little bit turns into a lot. Do I have any regrets about going to the show? Absolutely not. I would do it again in a heartbeat. The Mother Earth News Fair, it's really cool. It is. I mean, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to walk around and meet all the other vendors. My wife had a chance to do a little bit of that, but she really had a great time seeing a lot of the different products and different things. Now, it was it was really cool. If, if I was not a vendor, I would definitely attend. I mean, it's nice for the cake the kids there with the pet and zoo and the animals. There's a lot there besides television and video games. It was cool. It really was. That's great. Do you have any logistical tips for any, especially vendors that are looking to go cross country or even smaller distances where they're taking their wares with them? Depends. My product is a little bit bigger than most products. I took enough product to try to pay for my trip, but most people aren't going to drive across country. You know, I drove across country because I wanted to drive across country. I could have shipped my material out there and flown, but then you can't see what we did see from an airplane. You don't realize how much desert there is out there between New Mexico and Oklahoma all the way into California, but it's a beautiful country. I mean, so all I can say is somebody that wanted to attend the fair, give it a shot. What do you got to lose? It's only money. You can't take it with you. You No, but sometimes you have to weigh things other than monetarily. Sometimes you have to weigh things in relationships, meeting people, and plus getting away from work for a while and then going out there and meeting all these people. It changes your perspective on things. You know, it takes the cobwebs out of your head. You start thinking a little bit different. You get away and you can relax. You can breathe instead of the hump, you know, every day going to work, going to work, going to work. So now it's cool. Mother Earth News, very nice people. Very cool. 
Okay, we're going to pause the conversation right there. What you're listening to right now is a special edition podcast. These episodes all have to do with the Mother Earth News Fair in Albany, Oregon of 2019. At the time I'm recording this, we have learned so much about how to take advantage of events, and I want you to be able to use this information in your own business. Go to brianjpombo.com slash secrets. We are going to be putting out helpful materials on how you can use events to grow your business. When you go to this page, you will either see our latest programs, or if you make it there early enough, you will see an email address capture page. Put in your email address, and we will be sure and update you as soon as we get these out there. You're not going to want to miss this. If you get in early enough, you can get a special deal. These are principles that never go away. These programs will be based on the experience of people who have written books, spoken at the events, or exhibited there, talking about how to use events, books, and speaking, all to build your business. That's B-R-I-A-N-J-P-O-M-B-O dot com slash S-E-C-R-E-T-S. BrianJPombo dot com slash secrets. And now, back to the conversation. Where do you find new customers at besides doing shows like this? I have a website and I have my trailer and my trailer has signage on it. It's word of mouth. I'm knocking on every door I can find and knock on. You know what I mean? Like I said, I live in Maryland, so I'm trying to... I've been sending emails and trying to meet people from San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey. I'm pulling up on the internet. I'm trying to find addresses for people. And I'm sending them out emails, trying to get responses back. And some of them I'm getting responses back from, some of them I'm not. I just got my patent a few months ago to try to market my product. So right now it's baby steps. I can't expect my business to be in Home Depot and Lowe's and everywhere else when I'm a startup business. It's just a matter of baby steps. You got to crawl before you can walk. You know what I mean? So it's one of those Mm -hmm. things. If my product was like Coca-Cola, I wouldn't have to educate my customers. I'm hoping that the more composting comes up into the forefront, the more people see how beneficial it is to compost, that it might make my job a little easier, but only time's going to tell. Right now, my expectations are sky high. My attitude is positive. I know I'm going to do good. I know my business is going to succeed. I know I'm going to get my compost pail into a lot of households, and I'm going to be able to help the environment in some way. I try not to get too high. I try not to get too low. I try to stay on even keel. I try to look people in the eye and tell them the truth. If I can provide my customer with all the information that I have about my product so they can make an informed decision, then they can say, yeah, it's pretty cool. Maybe I'll buy this or no, this ain't for me. But at least I did my job and I provided them all the information. I'm not going to sit there and lie to somebody and I'm not going to force my product on any person. What I want the person to do is to say, man, that's pretty cool. Hey, I'd like to have one of those. And then when they buy it, then if they have a problem, then we do FaceTime customer service to help them walk through their issues. And I stand behind my product. I can tell you the pluses and the minuses of my product. At the end of the day, you got to live with yourself. So long as I'm honest with me and I'm honest with them and I'm not trying to hustle nobody and I'm trying to provide them the best product that I can make to do the best job that it can do. And I hope there's some teachers and all this now out there because I would be open to donating a few compost pails to a couple of different schools if they want to teach, like, say, kindergartners, first grade, second grade of how to compost. And, you know, I know teachers' budgets are tight and they don't have money for a lot of school supplies. And also, I can't donate compost pails to every school district in the country, but I'd be willing to help some. Then who knows? Maybe if I donate 20 compost pails, each class got 40 kids. Hey, if they can teach 200 kids about compost, it might be a good thing. That's a great idea, Scott. No, but see, the thing people don't understand is, is the compost, you need four things. One, you need nitrogen. And the homeowner provides that with their carrots, onions, celery, coffee, eggshells, tea bags. Second thing you need is carbon, okay? With our compost pail, we're the only compost product that provides you with a carbon source. There are a lot of experiments of how to make it work and... You have to have the right carbon source. So, all right, we, we provide two carbon sources. One carbon source we provide is peat moss. We provide the peat moss because peat moss 
holds moisture. And the second carbon source we provide is pine bedding. Pine bedding serves three functions. One, it is another carbon source, but it's a harder carbon source, so it takes longer for it to biodegrade. The second function it serves is it keeps the pail loose so it's easy to turn. The third function that it does is that when you turn the pail, the pine bedding keeps air pockets inside of the material so the decomposer organisms can form faster. Now, the third thing you have to have is air. So on the top of our pail, on 360 degrees of the pail, we have air holes. So close to the outside, so it gets cross ventilation of air. The more air that the material inside the pail gets, the more the decomposer will form, it aids in faster decomposition. The fourth thing you have to have and you must have to compost is turning. So when I design my compost pail, it has a handle on the outside of the pail. It has an internal auger inside of the pail. So when you turn the handle on the outside of the pail, it turns the material inside of the pail, which mixes and aerates the material, which aids in faster decomposition, which means it composts faster. I tried to make it simple. I talked to some people, oh, I got a big compost pile out back and I turn it with a pitchfork. I said, yeah, but you're 74 years old. How long are you going to be able to turn? I mean, the thing is, most people think composting needs to be hard. Three separate bins and all this other stuff. It don't. With our compost pail, it composts faster than anything out there. So you don't need all that space in your yard. It's a five-gallon pail. Normally, my wife cooks four or five days a week. I have to empty my pail out about every three or four months. So each time I empty the pail out, I've composted 180 pounds of organics. And I'm emptying out about four and a half gallons or four gallons of compost. That's how much organics that this pail eats because it all decomposes. But if you throw it in the trash bag, try throwing 200 pounds of stuff in the trash bag. See how many trash bags you got to have. So once you start seeing how it works and how much you're not putting into the trash, it makes you feel good. It makes me feel good. It's like going on a diet or exercise. You can have all the good intentions in the world to do the right thing but that donut looks awful good. When things are hard to do and they become a hassle, you stop doing it. But when you have a tool like the compost pail that's easy to use and you see fast results, you'll continue to do it. That's why I designed it the way I did because I want it to be fast, easy, and simple. And the main thing I wanted it to be was affordable. Because a few people say, oh, well, you know, you need to make it look like something somebody can't make themselves. I said, yeah, but if I did that, then I'm getting from the 40 or $50 price range up to a couple hundred dollar price range. So the less people can afford it, the less people want to do it. People are surprised how much organic material this small compost pail can chew up. I just want to explain to all the listeners out there that I would love them to visit my website. I would love them to look at my product. And I'll make two promises to you. One works. It does exactly what it's designed to do. It composts faster and quicker than anything out there in the market. And I stand behind my product. You buy it, you don't like it, send it back and give your money back. Simple as that. Is everybody going to be happy with it? Probably not. But I know it's a good product. You know it's a good product. You've seen it. It's a great product and I love all the energy you have for it and everything else, which is why I wanted to get you on the show. If we were to get back together, let's say we talked again a year from now and we looked back over the last 12 months, what would have had to have happened for you to feel happy with the progress concerning your business and your composting pit? Well, the number one thing is if the business could be self-sufficient to where I could dedicate 100% of my time to my business. Everybody needs to understand something. Every one of these compost pails are made by hand. They're all made by hand in the United States by me. No, they're not made in a foreign land. What I would like to happen is I would like my product to be picked up by a major retailer like Home Depot, Walmart, Lowe's, because right now I'm not making a ton of money on it, okay? And it's the cheapest price that I can sell them for right now. You see, the way it works is the more material I buy in bulk, the cheaper it is. If I could create a good amount of sales that I can buy the material in bulk, then I can lower the price. So if I lower the price, then more people can afford it. That would be what I would like to happen. I'm kind of a pretty simple guy. I'm not a materialistic person. I don't wear one piece of jewelry. That's not what I do. I work with my hands. I'm a construction worker. You know, I build buildings and monumental if that could happen. I mean, if I can make the same money working for myself as I'm making work for somebody else, that would be a plus plus. Because I have other things in the pipeline, all the different type of composters that I'm working on besides just for households. But right now, the research and development that I need to do on those other products, all that's put on hold right now because I need to make my business self-sufficient. Everybody said, oh, well, you need to get on Shark Tank. You know, I mean, that's a pretty 
lengthy process to try to do that. But it would be really cool that if one of those people, like maybe not one of those people, but if somebody else in somebody works for Home Depot, somebody works for Lowe's, somebody out there that might listen to this broadcast and say, hey, let's look at the product. Let's see if it's something that's viable for us. You know, I mean, I don't know, but all I know is that me making a product cheaper so I can put more money in my pocket is not really it's not really the way I'm thinking because whatever money I make, I'm putting back into the company. Am I having all the success that I hoped I would have early? No. Am I hitting a few speed bumps in the road? Absolutely. Is it discouraging me? Absolutely not. No, but oh, I, I, that's great. But, no, but to be honest with you though, I have really high hopes that I'm going to meet some people out there, some people into the green buildings or doing right for the environment. I'm going to meet some people that are going to see how great my product is and they're going to maybe open a few doors for me. If you don't shake the tree, nothing's going to fall out of it. I'm one of them type of guys, man, I get up 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning to go to work. I work all day. So as long as I keep getting up, put my nose to the grindstone, and I keep moving forward day after day after day, only good things can come out of it. I'm going to do my best to just help keep pushing it along and try to help as many people as I can. I appreciate being on your show because, you know, I'm just trying to get the word out there. You know, I mean, we have one planet. If I don't do anything and you don't do anything, nothing's going to change. That's great. That's fabulous. So are there any other questions I didn't ask you that you wish I would have? Not really. I just want people to understand that a lot of these different municipalities are giving you compost receptacles, trash cans, and they're coming by picking up all your organics and stuff. How much money in fuel, trucks, equipment, CO2 they're putting in the air, labor, insurance, that's just to get it to the landfill. Then all the equipment, labor, CO2, how long it takes this stuff to biodegrade in the ground to where all the money that they're spending, I think there are thousands of other programs out there that all these communities could benefit by, by taking that money. And even if it's paying for school lunches for kids, or even if it's like, say, a single mother has a couple kids and she needs daycare and so she can go to school and get an education so she can get a job so she can take care of herself. I mean, those are some pretty good things. They could take money and use those resources. I'm sure other people have a whole lot better ideas where they can use the money for, to help the, the community instead of picking up your trash. I never claim to be the smartest guy in the world. I mean, there's a lot more smarter people out there than me that can see that, hey, man, if we the more people can get the compost at home, we ain't got to buy all these trucks and fuel and all this stuff. You know, then maybe this is millions of dollars we can use in our budget to help the community. Just my opinion. A lot of great ideas in there. I mean, everything that you're saying, I think you're heading in the right direction with everything you're doing. What could a listener do who'd be interested in finding out more? You keep mentioning that you have a website. What's your website address so people can find you? The website is the Earth, E-A-R-T-H, the number two, Earth, E-A-R-T-H, compostpale.com. And our email address is Earth to earthcp at gmail.com. Like I said, we'd be willing to answer any of your questions or anything you got. You know, I'm not a tree hugger by heart. I love my country. I love the world. I like seeing the blue sky. I like seeing white clouds. We I mean, like seeing green trees. You know what I mean? So I live in the Chesapeake Bay area, right, in Maryland. And Maryland's a big crab state, right? Chesapeake Bay blue crabs, that's what everybody does in Maryland, right? So ever since I was a kid, Chesapeake Bay watershed, it's about taking care of the bay. We have one bay. And most people in Maryland, you go to DMV, you get saved in the bay license plates where they take $15 and they donate to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. They have all kinds of cleanup programs, you know, just like any other city, you know what I mean? So I ride across the Bay Bridge every day. I see the Chesapeake Bay, you know what I mean? And I was born and raised here. I wouldn't know what to do if I'd never seen it again. Because when I was a kid growing up, downtown Baltimore, you got all these companies just dumping all their chemicals right into the harbor. Now they're cleaning it up. In the last 10 years, they've been cleaning up the bay and the harbor. And now the wildlife's coming back, crab population's bigger, the fish population's bigger, the marshes are growing back, and which filters the bad sediments out of the water. Everything's hand in hand, you know what I mean? So whether you live in Wyoming or you live in Maryland like I do, you depend on your environment, whether you buy my product or not. Please, just do even just a little bit. It does matter. It really does. 
Hey, thanks so much, Scott. This has been a lot of fun. Really interesting getting to hear about your journey. And we can't wait to hear more. I'd love to have you back on another time if we can in the future. See where you're going from here. Thanks for being on the Off The Grid Biz Podcast. Hey, I appreciate you having me. And I would love to be on your show again. I, I really would. To you and everybody else, have a great weekend. You too. Hey, thank you. Scott is a really great person. Within the first few minutes of meeting him, it was very clear that he had a whole lot of passion for his product and all the issues that surround it. I'm going to point out a few things that he said just to focus on them a little bit. I think he made a really good point when he was talking about it all depends on how you gauge your success when he was discussing how well they did at the fair. He said, I may not have made my money back on the trip, but I set up this huge trip to where we were going across country, dragging all this stuff with us and got to see all these great things and meet all these great people. And that's really cool. It's good to be able to step back and look at things, not just from a monetary perspective, but in the long term perspective of what am I getting out of it? I mean, what a great story just being able to go across country and come out to the Oregon Fair. He also echoed what a lot of people who visited the fair said, which was you have a real eclectic group of people. And it's not like you see eye to eye on everything, but you do have something in common. The overall commonality of wanting to make the world a better place and seeing each individual as being necessary to create that on their own first and then going out from there. That self-reliant message is weaved throughout every person that was tied to this Mother Earth News Fair. Very cool. Very neat idea. I love his dogged determination. And that's one of the things that a lot of business owners or executives have in the very beginning when they're getting their business up and running. And sometimes you'll lose that over time. Sometimes with success, it kind of takes you to a point that you don't necessarily have that determination and persistence. But I love how he said he's knocking on every door that he can. He's looking for any way to be able to bring this dream about. Finally, I think his most important point was a personal one. And that's that I try not to get too high, I try not to get too low, and I try to keep everything on an even keel. I think that's always important to keep in mind. Keeping your own mentality in place while you're going through the ups and downs, especially in the very beginning of a business, is probably the most important advice you could ever get, as long as you're willing to take it. I think anyone that listens to this can say that Scott has the right attitude about this. He's going at it with enthusiasm, determination, but he's also willing to let it grow on its own. He's doing this part-time. This is in addition to the work that he already does during the day. So it's really neat to be able to have something like that that he can build up. And if you know anyone that can help Scott go to the next level with his business, be sure and get in touch with him. Can't wait to hear more about what Scott Smith is going to be doing in the next 6 to 12 months. Join us again on the next Off the Grid Biz Podcast, brought to you by the team at brianjpombo.com, helping successful but overworked entrepreneurs transform their companies into dream assets. That's B-R-I-A-N-J-P-O-M-B-O. Com. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the Off The Grid Biz podcast, go to offthegridbiz.com slash contact. Those who appear on the show do not necessarily endorse my beliefs, suggestions, or advice, or any of the services provided by our sponsor. Our theme music is Cold Sun by Dell. Our executive producer and head researcher is Sean E. Douglas. I'm Brian Pombo, and until next time, I wish you peace, freedom, and success.